uh, if everybody could mute uh, their audio uh, unless they have a question. And if you do have questions, please feel free to jump in with them. Um, this is the RFID for you uh, fast track certification training. We're doing a little uh, pre training to get everybody ready for the, the one day course uh, to be presented at RFID Journal Live this year. Uh, my name is Mark Brown. Uh, I'll be doing your presentation this morning. Uh, in the session with us, uh, we have Arkeet Dua, uh, project manager, and Sanjeev Dua, CEO of RFID for you. Uh, any words, gentlemen? Uh, thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, we are all, all looking forward to next month's RFID uh, certification training, uh, which is fast track. This is going to be very fast paced. This is probably going to be uh, 14th or 15th year of uh, offering one form of certification training or another at RFID Channel Live. And uh, we'll be, uh, you know, this session is going to be uh, a prep for what's going to happen all in one day. The regular training is actually a three-day course which happens in our lab here in Concord, California, which is right next to San Francisco. We have a full experience center where people can come, do hands-on, and do all the product testing and things like that. And this is, uh, uh, since it's going to be fast track, we really, uh, and going to be condensed, uh, we uh, try to do some of the basic sessions so that people can get uh, started and get ready. In addition to this uh, webinar, there will be a lot of other prep uh, stuff like, uh, um, you know, we have quizzes on our website. We have, this video will be uploaded. Uh, and please ask us any questions what you see from the domains which are going to be testing uh, at uh, uh, live. Uh, the testing is going to be for next two days, 11th and 12th, towards uh, lunchtime. Or any other question, we'll be more than happy to answer. With that, I'll be passing the podium to uh, Mark, a very well-labeled uh, presenter, and he's going to take it forward. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, first, let me start off by saying I have an immense amount of respect for everyone in here. You guys are signing up for a one-day course of, of uh, some fairly extensive material, and I'm glad that everybody came uh, to the to the uh, pre-sessions because um, it's it's an awful lot of ground to cover in one day. <laughs> um, but the fact that you signed up and you're here means you're up for the challenge, and I think that's fantastic. We're going to do our best to get you through this thing. Um, so let's kick it right off. This is uh, an RFID technology review. Um, much of this information is, is kind of prerequisite to making decisions around the questions that are going to be asked on the RFID certification exam. Uh, so this will be a lot of kind of core level learning um, that can be extrapolated into the advanced uh, material needed to answer the, the, the cognitive questions of the exam. And if my PowerPoint will behave, here we go. Uh, we'll start taking a look at the RFID technology review. So, as, as most of you are aware, RFID is the uh, next generation of data capture. Um, you'll see we have a, a couple of readers and, and tags. This, this is basically the, uh, the, the ubiquitous infrastructure surrounding RFID. So, tags need to be attached to goods and assets, which are then read by antennas and readers, um, and then turned into actionable data for things like work in process systems, logistics systems, uh, so WMS, ERP, uh, uh, manufacturing execution systems, lots and lots of different legacy systems um, need visibility to real-time data about the location and status of goods and assets uh, that are involved in that process. And so RFID is utilized to, to generate that visibility um, and, and this covers every vertical. I mean, it, this isn't exclusive to manufacturing or to healthcare or to retail. Um, there's a need for visibility in pretty much every industry. And I, I've deployed in, in, <laughs> in many of them. Um, I, I, there are benefits to be seen by all. Um, so as we look at the overall system, uh, you know, you've got your, your RFID tag attached to the asset going through various read zones. That's generating data, massive amounts of data that is then uh, incorporated into the, the existing IT network and then through to legacy systems. And, and these are systems that are invested 
uh, heavily in by by uh, company owners or or system owners, um, and they want to enhance the visibility of of those systems with real time data. So, as we look across the magnetic spectrum, um, this, this chart shows us the the common frequencies utilized for RFID. Uh, the the ones in particular we're going to focus in on are going to be uh, low frequency, which is 125 to 134 kilohertz, high frequency, 13.56 megahertz, UHF. Now UHF spans from uh, uh, 433 megahertz uh, upwards to uh, 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, and as, as well, we can, there, there's other systems that, that uh, function ultra wideband, for instance, and, and, and others that function outside of these uh, common frequencies. But the most common uh, and, and, and prevalent RFID frequency that we'll be dealing with is, is UHF. Um, you will see these kind of interchange as we apply to uh, legacy systems that have internal application versus kind of globally participating systems. And the global participation system, um, AKA EPC Global and, and the like, you'll see UHF is, is the primary uh, frequency used for this. So the various frequencies can be can be based on uh, can be determined for use based on government regulations. As you travel around from from region to region of the world, uh, you'll see that different countries uh, hold different parameters around which channels of UHF, which frequencies specifically can be used, what portion of each frequency can be determined to uh, to be a channel versus a, a sideband channel. Um, those frequencies are also determined by the physical materials being tagged themselves. Uh, you may want to, for instance, if, if you're in a highly metallic environment and you're on an internal visibility system, um, you may want to look at kind of a low frequency variant as opposed to a UHF variant, depending on, again, what the goals and objectives of the system are. Um, and that determines in the next two bullets, read range and speed of data transfer. Um, we'll dive more into these as we, as we look at the specific frequencies. Um, as seen here, low frequency. Um, so essentially, the, and, and we cover some of this in physics module, but, but as a high level understanding, the lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength. And the wavelength is what carries your data. So as a result, low frequency has lower read speeds um, and, and generally shorter read ranges. So the, the higher you go in uh, frequency, um, your, your wavelength decreases and potentially range increases with a, a lesser amount of power is, is generally how that works, but it's not always the case. There's some variation on that based on, again, uh, what the government of a particular region will allow you to use for um, power and, and sensitivity settings and, and channel spacing, those sorts of things. Um, if we look again at uh, UHF, as I, I mentioned earlier, um, Pallet or case level tagging, if you look under the usage column, you see pallet or, or case level tagging, DOD and Walmart mandates, and so much more. Um, this is really where the global participation happens. So if you're gonna have a tag on an item that is going to be read as it's manufactured in, uh, take your pick of countries, uh, shipped via intermediary through multiple other countries, and finally consumed in yet another country, um, you're gonna want a UHF tag. So the, the, the item, the tag and, and therefore the item and, and the trading partners can participate in this global network. So as a, as a total system overview, uh, we've talked about the tags being attached to the assets. There's different types of tags and we're gonna cover on some of those in a little bit. The tags uh, range in, in size and shape and, and economics. Um, frankly, you've, you've got tags that are costing very, very low in the form of a, of a label that's just attached to items, um, all the way up to very hardened and, and ruggedized tags, also some with advanced memory features and functionality that, that may not be built into uh, some of the label variants. Uh, these are read by uh, readers that can be mounted vehicles and can be portable. These can be fixed readers that are, are attached to infrastructure to look for items moving past a certain point of, a, of an environment. Um, alternatively, by handhelds. So if you have a need for mobile readers or uh, perhaps a, a scenario where a fixed reader is not going to accommodate 
small parts in a case. Maybe you want to have a, a handheld to, to help assess some of what's going on in, in those scenarios, um, as well for, for managing inventory in the field. Um, all of this rolls through into a, a middleware uh, or an application. Did, did someone have a question? No, sorry, thought I heard something. <laughs> um, and, and all of that data is then refined by the middleware and application stack and then rolled up into legacy systems for decision making based on, again, near real time visibility. We've talked about the various components uh, of the RFID system. Um, one to call out here that we hadn't really talked about is the business process management. We'll look a little further into that as we as we go forward. But again, tags are connected to assets read by readers um, may incorporate various sensors. Uh, perhaps there's an interest in the state of assets. So for those, you may want to have uh, weight sensors or temperature sensors or, or loggers or perhaps vibration sensors. There's any number of sensors that can be incorporated with this to gain further actionable intelligence around what is happening with the tagged assets or tagged products at, at the internal workings of an organization as well as out at the edge. Um, and all of that centers around the business process management. Because uh, let, let's face it, when your assets and, and items are moving like they should, this should all be automated and you don't want to know about it. But when things go wrong, you want to know and you want to be able to respond quickly. And that's where business process management really plays a, a pivotal role in this uh, scenario. So we'll start by taking a look at some of the, the tags and labels specifically. So there's there's really three types of tags. Um, there's passive tags, uh, semi-passive tags, and, and active tags. By definition, a passive tag uh, does not have a transmitter. It doesn't have the ability to transmit a signal. So it, in, a, in essence, passive tags are receiving power from the reader and then modulating that power by uh, incorporating resistance. Sorry, I forgot to mute my phone. Shame on me. <laughs> um, they will then fluctuate power uh, that they receive by inducting, inducing uh, resistance across that. And, and in, a, in that essence, act like a, a signal mirror with a light source. Um, but in this case, it's a, an RF power source. Um, and reflect back the energy they need to reflect back to uh, communicate their identity. So they don't actually have a transmission circuit. And in that same vein, semi-passive tags um, often contain a battery and have uh, potentially sensors. They use still this, this reflected power method known as backscatter to communicate because they don't have a transmission circuit built into them. Um, and, and this is where things change. Now, when we get to active tags, these have a transmitter built in them. They will transmit on specific cycles, either polled or, or queried. Uh, um, and and they can do things very, very differently. Um, often these tags are used, uh, and actually every time I've seen them used, they're used for more of a proprietary system. It gives internal visibility and offers specific functionality that may or may not be beneficial on a, on a global partner trading model, uh, for instance. We'll talk more about these as we move forward. Um, so the, the form factor is gonna determine a lot about kind of what the tag looks like. We've given some examples off here on the right. Um, but the form factor, ultimately, right, if you're, if you're tagging and tracking boxes, well, label's going to be the name of the day, right? But if we're tagging, tagging and tracking people, uh, you can't really slap a label on people. I mean, you can, but <laughs> success is limited at best because people tear it off, it falls off, it gets worn, whatever happens. So wristbands or buttons can be uh, utilized. Wristbands being, um, I've seen these range from paper wristbands that have adhesive that you wrap around and put on to uh, expandable nylon or polyester uh, wristbands with tags embedded in them, as well buttons sewn into uniforms, um, all sorts of different options when we, when we start looking at those sorts of things. Um, so here, here's the, the kind of breakdown of, the, again, that passive, semi-passive, and active. Um, again, from left to right, no power supply, no transmitter for a passive tag. They're simply there to reflect energy. For a semi-passive tag, it has a power supply because it's maintaining some sort of data and, and enacting a measurement, um, be that temperature, vibration, uh, chemical sensitivity. There's, a, there's a plenty of different options there, um, but still no transmitter, still reflecting that data 
um, reflect using a, a reflected data as its means of communication with the reader and then over to active which will have a power source of some sort and and that transmitter we're going to start off the discussion with passive tags so there will be an integrated circuit and an antenna all in kind of one form factor and this could be again we talked about the wristbands these can be the lanyard base these can be adhesive backed labels um, the point is they're all going to have these components and on the integrated circuit there's going to be memory to store data and some small bit of processing logic uh, to again induce that resistance across the antenna to reflect less or more power based on how much resistance is being applied um, the memory uh, there is read-only memory built into each tag um, and based on the bank that you're addressing uh, that read-only memory can be used to serialize the tag itself or the item it's attached to. Um, utilizing some of these memory banks, we can identify right away who the manufacturer of the IC attached to a tag is uh, and what its enhanced features are, for instance, and, and be able to address those accordingly. There are banks of the memory that are read-write. This is so that uh, end users can incorporate existing asset tag or product tag structures. If, uh, if perhaps they already have a SG10 designation through GS1 or, or some similar uh, number scheme that they've already um, been utilizing within their facility, that can now be written to this memory bank on a passive and a, and a semi-passive tag. Um, and they can be programmed at the factory or field programmable. Optionally, they have the ability to permanently lock or password protect data within the tag. Um, this is, th there's a couple of reasons why you'd want to do that. We'll cover more on those in future slides. Um, the IC, uh, right, the, 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 the name of the day is, is uh, EPC Class 1 Gen 2. Uh, Gen 2 is, is the um, standard by which tags are, are measured today to, to meet this global trading network that's been established around UHF technology. Um, there's 40 to 50,000 transistors on, on that little bitty chip, which is the si size of a, a, a pen, the, the ball and a ballpoint pen. It's, it's that size or smaller. It's amazing amounts of power packed in a little bitty space. Um, this IC receives its power from the radio waves that are generated by the reader and captured by the antenna on the tag. So when you see a tag, uh, and we've seen a few pictures so far, you'll see a little dot in the center and that's the IC, right? That's where the, the magic happens. Um, but to get that to turn on and to, to start doing its thing, it needs to pull in power. And it does that by nature of the rest of the tag. So you'll see on the rest of the tag, there's a big antenna design. Um, it's, it's generally a circuit that's attached to it and on the back of a label or something to that effect. Um, that's where the power is gathered that then lets that chip do its thing. So depending on the design of the tag, that IC will either be directly attached to the antenna or attached to a strap that is then put on the antenna. Um, there's a couple of manufacturers in particular that utilize a strap design. Uh, mixed thoughts on this one, you know, um, they're, they're easily attached to antenna design. So for rapid prototyping of tags, that's excellent. Um, they can reduce the cost of manufacturing as the straps are generally easier to handle and attach. They don't require such precise placement uh, on the antenna. Um, and they're, they're less prone to damage because the strap design itself protects the chip um, quite a bit. Um, in the earlier days of this technology, this was a huge concern because there, there was a lot of uh, quality issues that we, we fought as an industry, but those are, are now past us. And so, um, again, varying schools of thought around whether the strap is required or not kind of depends on the application and, and, and the design. Um, and then the substrate, uh, that's going to be the, the carrier. So if you think about the antenna being that little circuit board we talked about, the strap or IC being attached to that, that all has to be held together by something. So that's either going to be uh, plastic attached to a paper label, that can be nylon, that can be fabric, that can be anything. <laughs> but it's going to hold all those it's going to be the carrier that all of this sits on, which attaches then to the object wanting to be tracked. Um, if we look at this is kind of a blown up view of a, of a high frequency inlay um, without seeing the title, we, we would be able to identify this as an HF inlay uh, just based on 
this antenna design, um, the, the lower frequencies of, of RFID that we talked about, so HF and, and LF, uh, function in a, a magnetic side of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and they use magnetism to induce uh, a power to move through the coils that we see here. Um, an HF tag will have seven turns. If you count them, there's seven little rows of circuits that are organized into a circle right there. Um, those seven turns indicate to me that that's HF. And, and generally that's uh, the reason for that seven turns specifically is to reach either, an, uh, it's a fraction of the wavelength that 13.56, in this case HF, um, functions at. If you'll recall from the, the previous slides, the lower the frequency, the longer that wavelength. So for an LF tag, which is lower than this, you'll have hundreds of circles. <laughs> um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a much more expensive tag to produce. Um, and as we move toward the other end of the spectrum, UHF and microwave, um, those that's much more toward the electric side of the electromagnetic spectrum. So there's no coils required to induce that. Um, it's more capacitance across an antenna. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in future slides. Um, and as seen here in this design, the brown portion of this tag and what's what's being pointed to uh, as an antenna, that's the circuit design I talked about. That's what's actually collecting the power from the reader. You'll notice the strap is in the center and we have a blow up of the strap at the bottom. It looks like a bow tie. Well, there's a little little bitty chip in the middle and then two big lobes coming off of the side of that. Those are what are used to attach this uh, to that antenna and, and thus the tag. Um, Again, makes that chip much easier to handle because you can see now you've got these much larger pieces off to the side where you can place that on a circuit and not have to have as precise of, an, uh, of a position as you would with just the chip itself. So the passive tag uh, design is, is inherent to, to, to this is the antenna. The antenna consumes most of that tag area. Again, the chip is just a little tiny dot in, in, in the overall design. Um, and we've listed here uh, LF tag. In this case, it's a picture of, a, of an animal tag. So this is a tag that would be injected. Um, today, they're injected into livestock and into pets. If you've ever had your, your uh, pet taken down to the vet and, and pet ID put into the animal, uh, that's what's been placed into your, into, uh, you know, Fido or Fifi. Um, these are, are designed to be read in very uh, moisture prevalent environments, AKA a body. <laughs> um, so there's lots of water and, and these read well in water because they're magnetic. Uh, the HF tag shown here, again, you'll see seven turns of that coil going around the outside, uh, six, six to seven, it kind of depends on the design. Um, UHF again there, there's no coil design here you'll see these are these are much more linear and you've got basically two halves of an antenna with the chip in the middle and the capacitance across that antenna or resistance across that antenna will determine the power flow through the chip itself and, and how that works um, and then 2.4 gigahertz this isn't uh, as we as we continue to climb the spectrum um, the wavelength shortens and uh, thus, the this one, this particular one, has it has a, what appears to be an enormous chip in the middle. That tag's actually been blown up a lot. So the size of that chip is relative to the size of the chip in the UHF tag immediately above it. That'll give you an idea how how much that tag has been uh, zoomed in, so you can see it. Um, so there's different form factors for these uh, for these passive tags. Um, one of the more common variants as we uh, look across, again, kind of that global supply chain and, and trading network um, is the, the label variant, smart labels. Um, this is a, a supply chain with an RFID label embedded in it. This is kind of one of the first points of, of integration that you'll find in any uh, manufacturer or distributor or retailer or take your pick. <laughs> um, the, the reason being is they have labels today for everything. So if you're going into a uh, potential customer account, one of the easiest points of integration is their industrial printers where they print their barcode labels to put on their existing assets. Those can generally be substituted for an RFID enabled barcode printer that will now make a smart label containing all the same, excuse me, all the same data of the existing barcode label that the customer was using in the exact same format. So nothing changes from 
the physical point of view of the customer looking at their label, it looks exactly the same. The difference is it now has RFID built in it. So instead of having to see that barcode to scan it, this becomes scanned just by nature of its presence in a read zone and, and can be no matter how many of them there are. So we'll, we'll cover that in, in future slides. Uh, any questions so far? Nope. Excellent. Um, so there's encapsulated passive tags. These are ruggedized tags, right? This is stuff that you're going to want to use in environments where a standard label tag might, uh, might not live very long. <laughs> um, so, or the, uh, these can also be used in, in environments where the same tag is going to be read over and over and over and over again and used throughout a process. Um, so I've seen tags uh, like these used in medical environments to attach to uh, surgical trays of equipment that are going to and from hospitals that then have to be um, sterilized via either nuclear radiation um, or through an autoclave. Um, to survive those environments, these tags have to be, you know, made extremely rugged. Um, I've seen variants of this tag, of, of ruggedized tags, actually designed to take a bullet from an AK-47. <laughs> I've I, I deployed those tags. Um, and seen that test performed actually. Uh, they keep working after they've been directly hit with a bullet. Um, they're designed for that because they're obviously designed for use in battle zones. Um, these are larger tags and designed again for conditions that you wouldn't probably see in a typical environment. Um, but there are ranges of this ruggedization that occur based on the environment the tag is destined for. Um, so the idea being you want the functionality of RFID to be isolated from damaging environmental elements, such as shock, such as impact, such as various chemicals and temperatures that can damage electronics if, if exposed. Um, and again, this may just be a matter of reusability. So if I have a, a tote-based system in my, in, in my environment, I attach one of these to a tote, and then no matter what's in that tote, I can associate that tag to it and track it as it goes through my manufacturing or distribution environments. Um, so th there's there's a number of options as it comes to uh, passive tags. <laughs> and I still didn't shut that ringer off. I thought I did. Sorry about that, folks. Give me one second, and I will turn this off. All right, that shouldn't be bugging us again. Sorry about that. Um, no? yeah. Okay, now. <laughs> so again, all passive and semi-passive tags employ this backscatter communication. Um, they don't have a transmission circuit. They don't have the ability to transmit without a reader present because they're not actually transmitting. They're simply reflecting power. Uh, and this is a concept we will we will dive further into. Um, so I talked a little bit about the magnetic and electro the, the electromagnetic spectrum and how one side of that is more magnetic and the other side is more electrical. So if you look at the low frequency and high frequency on the left, these are inductively coupled. Um, these are the magnetic end of the spectrum. Um, they're utilized in environments where metals present, where there's high high amounts of liquid. Um, and on the other side of that, we have the electric end of the spectrum, which is communication via passive backscatter, um, and that's going to be UHF or microwave. This is the reflected power um, that I that I had talked about across a UHF tag. Um, and the easiest way I can I can associate these for you, um, if if any of you have ever been fishing or know anyone who fishes, they use a. Uh, uh, a sensor that goes under the boat to detect where the fish are, right? It's a, it's a little radar. Um, does anybody know how that attaches to the bottom of the boat, usually? No takers? Come on, you guys got to start drinking more coffee. With a magnet? <laughs> With a magnet, yes! So that magnets work in water. Oh, screwed or glued on. Carl, that's, a, that's also a good one. Um, Generally, for the smaller fishing boats, they're attaching that sensor to the bottom of the boat with a magnet. Thunk. And because magnets work in water. And so what happens when you drop 
for instance, an electrical cord in water. Yeah, nothing works. <laughs> so um, remembering the LF and HF are, are good around water, that's due, due to their magnetic properties where UHF and microwave don't function as well in the presence of water. Um, they can be tuned to work better in water than they do, but inherently to their, their frequency, um, they're not going to function as well as the magnetic technologies in a, in a heavily laden environment with water. And also, obviously, again, the metal, right? Because you're attaching to, to metal with that magnet. Um, magnetism does transmit to and through uh, metal. Um, so we talked about the near field coupling and inductive coupling, as it's known. Um, there's a short distance associated with LF and HF tags, typically up to about two feet. Now, this is only as it applies to passive. There are active LF and HF tags and they break all the rules. We're not gonna cover any of those. <laughs> they're, they're fairly proprietary. Um, I don't believe you'll see questions about those on the exam. I'm trying to remember. Um, Sanjeev, are there questions pertaining to uh, uh, Ruby, for instance, on the exam? Yes, they are. Uh, uh, and we covered it in one of the last domains, uh, uh, related technologies, Ruby, Ruby Zigbee, uh, and all the others which are coming. You know, there okay. are a few questions on that, yes. Okay. So, yeah, the, the questions should be minimal uh, because we, as the test was designed, it was designed with um, core knowledge for the market and, and the needs associated with that in mind. So the, the prevalent technology gets the prevailing amount of questions. <laughs> um, there are gonna be questions related to some of the active uh, LF and HF antenna designs and, and, and applications, actually more so the applications than the design, um, just because it's a fairly customized technology. Um, but what we'll talk about here is strictly passive. So again, read range about two feet, um, the antennas are not as directional, right? This is magnetic. So it's, it's gonna be magnetism all around an antenna uh, as opposed to in a, a specific direction from the antenna for the most part. The readers are less expensive because they've existed for a long time and, and uh, the components are cheap. They've been out there for quite a few years. Um, and you can, can, you can gang multiple antennas to a single reader. Um, and it makes it easy to read objects with water and aqueous liquids. Now, again, back to that pet ID, if we were, we were talking about it earlier, either the ear tag for cows, if anybody's seen that for livestock or the injectable tag for you know, your dog or cat. Um, when the vet tries to read one of those tags, they get right up on it, right? So they have a little reader they put right up between your dog's shoulder blades. And usually when they're within a couple of inches, they'll see an ID pop up and, oh, hey, this dog's owned by such and so, and here's his health records and whatever else is there. Um, so this lower read distance also provides more secured reading, which is why this is used in a lot of secure payment systems and ID systems. Um, this is the inductive coupling we, we talked about. You'll see in the middle, this is the magnetic field. Um, and a magnetic field, what makes this work is that magnetic field is not constant. It is constantly on the, on, the, on the flip side of the word constant, it is constantly fluctuating. So it, it uh, magnetism pushes, then pulls, pushes, then pulls. And as that's occurring, now you put the coil of the tag antenna in that field where it's experiencing this constant push pull and the electrons in that tag coil start moving because of that movement of the field. Um, and that generates the power that the tag then, again, the same method that we use in, in UHF, but now just the chip is exercising that on the power in the coil and it's applying resistance um, or letting the electricity flow to reflect that energy back to the antenna uh, of the reader, which is pushing that power out and then detecting changes in that power as it comes back. So the tag will basically lean on that magnetic field um, and the reader will detect those changes and report them. Uh, here again is a, a picture of a HF tag. When we start to move up to the UHF tags, again, these are the ones you'll see the most of in the market. They're, they're common because global trading partners are able to use them across multiple countries, multiple jurisdictions, um, and use them successfully literally around the world. Um, so they're, they're subject to various uh, power and frequency restrictions. 
But for the most part, if you can utilize a tag here, you can utilize it in South America, you can utilize it in Australia, you can utilize it in China, you can utilize it in India. Um, these are designed with that in mind. So they're, they're made to be shipped and read around the world by various trading partners. They have a read distance that is very dramatic based on the size of the tag, based on the object it attaches to. I've seen read ranges on UHF tags as low as a foot. I've seen it as high as 85 feet um, on a passive tag. So, I mean, it's, it's really choosing the tag based on the expected read zone is important. If you're gonna be reading these at a dock door, you wanna get a tag with about six to eight feet of read range. Um, if you get a tag that has 20 feet of read range and all you need is that six to eight, you're gonna accidentally read tags that are too close to your existing read zone. So if you're at a dock door, you might pick up things that are back in the warehouse and, and try to ship them accidentally, right? If your read range is, is too good with these tags. So it's important to judge a tag based on the expected read zones. Does that make sense? Sorry, I'm used to doing this in a classroom where I can see everybody. And when I ask, does that make sense? I see heads nod. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes sense. But uh, you also want to be on the safe side, maybe, if you have a requirement to uh, have a read uh, until 50 centimeters, then maybe with HF, you're not on the safe side because it's like three feet. But how, how good is it near the end of the range? Yes. Um, and, and so it's also worth noting that the HF limitation, this will also vary, again, based on the size of the tag for HF. So, I mean, the, the smaller the tag, generally the shorter the read range. Um, so you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, if I'm in a, uh, a facility, for instance, I've got tags that I've designed attached to my objects with that six to eight foot read range in mind. Well, what if I develop a new business application where I need to read them at 30 feet? <laughs> so you've got to yep. kind of think about that with the future in mind. The good news is these, these read zones can, can generally be tuned. Um, and we'll cover on this more in the readers, but you can set a sensitivity level at which the tags respond. Um, so if you think of it, uh, if anybody's familiar with uh, kind of audio effects or those sorts of things, a noise gate you have to be louder than this to participate in this conversation, right? Um, essentially is what a noise gate does. Or for those of you who don't know audio technology as well, uh, think about the sign at the, uh, at the roller coaster, right? You have to be this tall to ride. <laughs> um, the, tags, the, the tags basically have to meet a, a certain volume standard um, to play in a read zone at a, at a dock door. And if the tag's responding too quietly, the dock reader just ignores it. It knows it's there but it's ignoring it because it's not loud enough to participate in that conversation. So mm -hmm. for those reasons, you may wanna have a tag that's, that's responding at, for instance, 20 feet instead of the six feet you require. Um, but it, it all comes down to, again, kind of designing around what your customer's needs are today and keeping an eye on what's coming, what's their future needs. Um, a great example of that might be a, a finder mode on a handheld. You know, I'm reading this tag at six feet at my dock door but now when I've lost an asset, I wanna walk through my facility with a handheld and when I'm within 20 feet of that object, I want it to start beeping. <laughs> so again, kind of looking at this as a, as a component of your design is gonna be very important. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was Govin. Thank you for your input. Yeah, it was happy. Great. Um, so far field coupling, this is also called passive backscatter. This is our, our primary means of communication with, uh, with UHF, um, as well as the UHF and microwave technologies and, and uh, uh, ultra wideband as well. Um, but the reader antenna is propagating this broadband signal. The tag antenna collects that signal. And so the, you'll see the broadband signal is the, the curvy line there on the top. The tag antenna then starts to reflect it collects enough of that energy to turn the tag on, and then it starts to reflect that energy back to the reader. Um, and that's the square waves that you see there at the bottom. Those are square to indicate modification. So a high being a one and a low being a zero, <laughs> depending on, again, the, the length of how long it's holding it high or holding it low, is gonna signal things to the reader, like the tag's identity, uh, perhaps like the current temperature um, of, a, of a tag 
Um, it could be all sorts of data. I mean, it, it could be really anything. We're limited here by our imaginations. Um, as we look at semi-passive tags, this is where things get a little tricky. So uh, there's no transmitter in a semi-passive tag, but communication range can increase dramatically. Um, so even though it's not assisting with transmission. Does anybody know why that is? All right, well, I'll, I'll give you the answer. Uh, <laughs> so the tags I mentioned on this last slide, uh, this one, the tag has to collect enough energy from this broadband signal to turn on the chip. Well, what if that chip was already turned on? That's where the communication range increases dramatically because if the tag is already running, if the chip is already up and, and listening and starts reflecting immediately, it can communicate a lot further away if you don't have to worry about collecting that power to turn the chip on. Um, this also allows for sensors. This can be any sort of sensor to be attached to that tag relative, again, to the size of that battery. Um, this costs more than passive tags uh, because of the, the nature of the circuit that you're building in. Um, I think the bullet here is a little bit uh, skewed, <laughs> perhaps. It says cost more than passive or active tags. Generally, active tags, I, I mean, this is going to depend on the functionality built in that active tag and, and what it's got. But generally, they're going to be at a price point between passive and active tags. Um, the storage ranges on these tags, I've seen them, you know, 64 kilobytes as listed here uh, up to megabytes. Um, kind of depends on, on what the tag is destined for. Um, Asset tracking is great with these. And, and again, this can be read by pretty much any Gen 2 compliant reader, but the Motorola Zebras, uh, Zebra readers are, are, are one that you know, we utilize for these. Um, as it applies to the semi-passive tags, uh, they, they don't have, again, that transmitter in them. They're still using the same communication method as a, as a passive tag. Um, there's fewer vendors for semi-passive tags. Uh, and, and that I think is due relative to the need within the market at the moment. I, I think there is a need for it. I don't know that the demand has been recognized. Um, people are still trying to get their head around inventory control with this. And, and some of the environments like hospitals and manufacturing environments have started to really grasp the concept of what these semi-passive tags can do and embrace it. Um, but the mainstream kind of retail shipping components and distribution really haven't found a use for that yet. Um, that's, that's going to be responsible for deployment on a global scale. Um, so here we've got a, a few examples of different tags, uh, semi-passive tags, and, and what they're capable of. You'll notice some of these have LEDs. So when I read the tag, if it's the one I'm looking for and it's in a, a pile of, of other, you know, and maybe all my assets are piled very close together. I've actually seen this done in the aircraft industry. Um, you go into a a lower chamber of an airplane that houses the computer and, and all of the various components of the aviation systems. And you're looking for one, your handheld is going to light up that tag. And then the tag will literally light up. An LED will start flashing. Here I am, come get me. Um, and you can swap out that component very, very quickly uh, as a result. There's a number of different options as these are concerned. Um, and as we look at active tags, these will, uh, the standards have changed a lot. There's there's the uh, Dash 7 Alliance, um, which was based loosely on ISO 18000-7. Um, this was kind of built around a proprietary technology that evolved into more of a global standard. But now with the advent of, of BLE and, and some of the other um, variants that we're seeing, uh, Zigbee, Ruby, active tags have changed dramatically. And things like read range, uh, there are tags that will communicate at a mile up to three miles, actually. Um, there are tags, again, active tags that are, you know, maybe only a hundred feet. It, this depends specifically on the technology, specifically on the purpose. Um, it, it varies very, very much. Uh, the tag shown here uh, is a military grade active tag. Um, you'll notice it has a battery compartment. That's the cylindrical part of that with the, the coin slot turn on the end uh, to replace the battery. They had to make those batteries a custom size for these tags so that they didn't get stolen and used in things like Walkmans <laughs> and, and MP3 players 
um, by by soldiers who didn't maybe really understand what the tag was there for, or didn't care at the time. Um, so yeah, they they changed the power sources to be customized. Um, these have built-in sensors like shock sensors, temperature, again, all sorts of good stuff that that are going to be useful uh, in those environments. Um, examples of this: healthcare positioning tags. Uh, if you've had a child recently, and uh, the the infant protection bracelet here. Um, you know, dad's at the nursery, you're carrying the kid around, don't get too close to the exit. Uh, that's, that happened to me. Uh, my, my, my youngest is six years old and, and six years ago, I was in the hospital with her and I got too close to the exit. Next thing you know, alarms are going off and I got security running out. I was just walking around with my kid. Um, didn't realize that that was an exit I wasn't supposed to go near. Uh, it, it generally helps if you read the sign too. I mean, that was sort of on me. There was a big sign that I didn't look at. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the internal thermistor, um, this is a temperature sensor. Um, it'll give you, uh, again, kind of acti actively monitoring temperatures of certain areas. Um, there's all kinds of options as it comes to active RFID tags. Uh, there are active RFID tags that go in soldiers' helmets that network to each other so that as a, a group of soldiers is deployed, you know the position of each relative to each other and they sense things like temperature. Um, they can sense things like heart rate, they can sense all, all kinds of good stuff to monitor that group um, and basically just give you, again, more visibility, which is what it's all about. Um, we talked about Dash 7. This is a, a active RFID standard, again, based loosely around ISO 18000-7. Um, data transfer, again, things like data transfer memory, built-in sensors, these are going to change dramatically from manufacturer to manufacturer and based on the purpose of the tag and what industry that you're using it in. Um, you know, obviously healthcare, pharmaceutical and defense are extremely concerned with security. So you can anticipate active tags and active tag systems in that industry to have high, high security standards. Um, in retail, probably not as much, right? Um, and in closed loop systems, not as much. It's going to really kind of depend on on what your what your final objectives are. The material to be tagged is gonna determine the type of tag. So um, I think I've mentioned this a couple of times, water and, and high moisture content are going to be very detrimental for UHF, um, where HF and LF are gonna function much better due to the magnetic versus electromagnetic coupling. Um, the metal can also result in a, a a characteristic known as detuning. Um, and essentially, uh, detuning is, is the tag it, unable to, uh, the, ta the tag antenna couples with the object. So the tag antenna is made out of metal, right? You attach it to a metal object, and as it gets closer to that, um, it's not really the frequency that's changing so much as the resistance of that antenna. Um, and the resistance if the resistance of the chip matches the resistance of the antenna, the tag's functioning optimally. As that resistance changes, the tag's power is going to decrease exponentially as that resistance increases or decreases off of that norm. Um, and so you'll have tags. Um, UHF has accommodated this by predisposing tags. So if you get a metal mount tag, it's designed with that change of resistance anticipated and expect it. So in free air, a metal mount tag for UHF is not gonna read very well at all. You'll get six, eight inches off the reader and it disappears. What, what is that? Now you put it on a can of soda or on a metal object and suddenly that same exact tag is reading from 10 feet away. Well, that's because now the resistance is where it was supposed to be. It was designed with that in mind. Um, so choosing the right tag based on the material you're going to be tagging is critical to the success of your projects. As we look at different types of materials, some of these materials are RF neutral. Cardboard, for instance, generally are not, the cardboard's not going to have a lot of uh, effects on the uh, the tag performance, unless of course it gets wet. Now, wet cardboard is going to be a pain in the butt. Uh, you know, it's, you're going to be dealing with the same stuff as as any other liquid at that point, and that's going to impede the progress of your of your tags. Um, carbon fibers and and again, liquids paste. Carbon fiber in particular is one that I know well. I, I did some deployments in a, in a carbon fiber facility, manufacturing facility, and 
they wanted to track every piece of carbon fiber. Problem is you can't put a tag on carbon fiber because the carbon fiber absorbs all the electricity and it doesn't leave anything for the tag to reflect. <laughs> um, so it ends up being a problem. Uh, there are ways to accommodate this and this is through either proper mounting of the tags or uh, positioning of the tags with an object, aligning it to perhaps a tote or a carrier, things of that nature. Um, plastics for the most part, unless they're carbon-based plastic, have no effect on tags in our RF neutral. Uh, metals and foil packaging, we've already talked about this, right? Metal reflects RF. Um, so if you put a tag, it's almost like putting a mirror on a mirror. Right? The, the smaller mirror will disappear into the larger mirror. You won't be able to see it because they're both doing the exact same thing and just throwing that power or the, the visible light waves in, in the case of our eyes back at us. Um, so being able to distinguish one from the other requires a little bit of creative mounting and usage of the tags. Question. Um, yes. Uh, what about the detuning uh, uh, with cardboard and plastics? You don't mention much about it. Is it something for the important? Most, or? Um, for the most part, cardboards, uh, if it's dry cardboard, right? Um, and this can be wax. Uh, Wax-based cardboard, um, like if you've seen heads of lettuce when they're shipped, are shipped in uh, uh, cardboard boxes that are coated with wax, right? That's to keep the cardboard dry so that the moisture from the, the lettuce, for instance, doesn't destroy the cardboard and, and the integrity of the box. And then you end up with lettuce everywhere other than in the box. Um, mm -hmm. Cardboard, for the most part, is RF neutral as long as it's dry. Uh, the same with plastic. Now, the exception to that is carbon-based plastics. So if you have a plastic that has carbon in it, um, then you, you need to be, like you can tell when you look at the plastic, it'll, it'll be a, a carbonate or a, or, or a non-carbonate plastic. If it's carbonate, you'll have to have a, a metal mount tag of some sort or mount the tag um, in such a way that it's a, a bit of a distance away from that plastic um, because they will detune. And, and detuning is, the, the word detuning kind of gives you the wrong impression. You're not actually changing frequency. It's changing the resistance of the antenna attached to the tag, right? Um, so you want to okay. ensure the tag is functioning optimally. Um, again, most cardboards and plastics are not going to affect tag performance at all. The exception okay, here. Go ahead. Oh, I said uh, it, it's clear. Okay, great. Um, so there's tags that can be attached varying ways. Again, kind of um, adhesive back labels. We've talked about those bolted or riveted tags. I've actually seen encapsulated ruggedized RFID tags in little metal buttons that can be welded on things. So you can use an arc welder or, or a MIG welder and weld them to various metal objects. Um, you can embed these tags. They can be printed right on a circuit board. So Amazon, for instance, prints an RFID tag in the circuit of every Kindle. So if you have a Kindle, scan it with a UHF RFID reader. I guarantee you'll see a number there that you don't recognize. That's your Kindle. Um, and, and more and more manufacturers are now manufacturing these tags into circuits for uh, internal use, tracking through repairs, uh, warranty, maintenance, that sort of stuff. Um, and it's great because <laughs> if you want to get a sub- the goal of this market all along has been to reduce the cost of tags because as the cost reduces, the applicability increases. Well, electronics manufacturers have it made because for them to incorporate an RFID tag, they're already designing and printing a circuit for the electronics in question. Adding a tag to that costs them a fraction of a cent. <laughs> and so for them to participate in this global trading network with their UHF tags attached to their objects, actually built right in, is beautiful because it costs them virtually nothing. Um, so we've covered up on the various frequencies, the types of tags, the performance based on the environment, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the environment here. But you have to watch for things that are going to that are going to cause you diminished read range. And again, primarily that's going to be liquids and metals. If you mount your tags and your readers responsibly, you can meet these challenges successfully and not have any problems. Um, you just have to bear in mind as you're looking at your customer's environment, you know, where is my exposure for
or liquids? Is it on my customer's products? Is it just uh, you know large objects moving through a read range? Um, as well, responsible mounting of the equipment, right? You, you need to, and this is one that we'll, we'll cover on in later chapters and, and you'll hear about it during the one day class, but if you're mounting sensitive electronics in rugged environments, you need to protect it. Otherwise you're replacing sensitive, expensive electronics in rugged environments. <laughs> That's no fun for anybody. Um, the tag materials themselves, as we talked about, can, can interfere with the tag operation. Um, as we looked at the components, the re readers, this can also be called an interrogator, um, is used to read and write to the tags. Uh, the antennas transmit the power from the reader to that tag. Uh, and you have the cable that kind of connects the two. Um, there's a software application that will sit behind all of this that will process that data, and that's the middleware. Uh, the, I mean, at the end of the day, these tags are thrown out amazing amounts of, of numbers that turn into data. Um, and that data is going to be useless to your back end system without something to interpret it. And, and in the past, middlewares were, were just there to interpret that data. Responsible middlewares, uh, and, and there's, a, there's a designation I'll make there, um, also exercise control on the readers. So that's going to be the difference in, in middleware systems when you really start to look at them. Um, and we'll cover on this in, in future modules. Um, many of the existing systems there today were designed like legacy barcode systems. Okay, give me the data, let me change that into your business transaction and, and hand it off. Advanced systems that are capable of not just RFID, but IoT functioning within a larger spectrum of goods and, and more responsible business process also exercise control over the devices in question. So readers, for instance, turning them off when they're not in use is critical to making other read zones nearby function well. Um, and that's the difference between a, a middleware and a good middleware. So we'll, we'll, we'll cover more on that. Um, I think everybody knows how barcoding works. Here's a few examples, right? The barcode is a license plate that then is looked up in a database and is applied to uh, an application. Um, you have to see it to scan it, right? A bar, that's, that's really the biggest difference between, uh, well, one of the big differences between RFID and, and barcode is line of sight only for barcode, regardless of how much data it has. Um, now, one of the other advantage, the other differences also is cost, right? Barcodes cost me a fraction of a cent to print, but for that fraction of a cent versus multiple cents for my RFID tag, I get very limited functionality as, as a result. Um, barcodes are written once and then read many times as opposed to RFID, which can be written as many times as you need to, can have data appended to it in the field, um, as well as read many, many, many times. Um, there's different types of, of barcodes, right? You've got the 2D barcodes, which contain multiple data elements. Um, they're, they're ubiquitous. I mean, they're everywhere, right? Who does not have a smartphone in their pocket? that will allow them to scan a barcode on a, an object in Best Buy and get more data about it. Pretty sure everybody here has one. Um, as you look again at the differences, however, it, it really kind of comes down to the business process and the function that you need. So with barcode, it's line of sight, it's very manual, it's very operator driven, um, but it's dirt cheap. <laughs> I mean, RFID, it's automated. It, it just happens by nature of your process. And your process can be a retail environment where a shopper's walking around a store or a manufacturer environment where your object's going from quality control back to back to shipping. I mean, it, it, it's automatic. It just happens. And it's read right. It's harder to replicate, more security, but it does come with a higher cost. Um, and I believe... Doing a quick time check. Yeah, we're at two minutes to nine, my time zone. So I don't want to keep anybody past our allotted time slot. Uh, let me open this up for questions. Yeah, I got a question about the quiz uh, and that is also part of uh, this, uh, uh, this course. Okay. Uh, yeah. I filled in the first quiz and I think I got my email address yeah. right in SurveyMonkey, and uh, I didn't get any feedback. 
Yeah, Is typically it's going to take, uh, no, no, no. Typically it takes uh, approximately around 24 to 36 hours for somebody to verify it and send across the response back. When is the last time you sent across a quiz? When you yeah, attempted maybe it today? Last week, somewhere last week. Okay. Uh, yep. Let me. And I, I can jump in on that. And if you actually see, uh, see uh, the mailer that went out yesterday, there's actually a link over there where you can actually go in and actually be able to view the answers as well. So it's uh, okay. a little more automated. You can actually, uh, if you see that email yesterday, there's a folder in the cloud where you can actually be able to see the answer. So you can be able to be able to log in as well. So feel free to um, view that as well. Okay, I will refer to that. Yeah, thanks. And we'll be adding more and more quizzes as we proceed towards, uh, uh, you know, April. And every week there is uh, a webinar which we are uh, scheduling. You know, additionally, if you guys want to schedule any one-to-one -one or if you have any specific uh, doubts, uh, you know, please let us know. We'll be glad to jump on the phone or webinar and uh, try to help you out. So if no more questions, uh, I once again thank you for attending today's uh, webinar and we'll again meet uh, next week. Until then, uh, please feel free to ask us any questions or uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot to hey, the thank team you. and thanks a lot everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.